Well, we just got back from watching, well, we're driving home, not back, uh, from watching the Thor uh, Love and Thunder film. And, uh, I mean, of course, we already created the plot for the next one. Yeah, you know how it was the greatest movie ever because some of our ideas and some of the ideas in there were ours, and then a lot of them were ideas that society, you know, we talk about, other people talk about, and it's, a, it's something that you can fit into the movie that just works, you know, it's obvious. Yeah, I was really pleased with the fact that they managed to fit pieces of the first film together, even though I didn't say it on microphone or a camera or describe anything in detail to too great of an extent. Um, I guess I would just say that, oh yeah, the one scene that I was a little bit annoyed by, uh, in the trailer, they did a fantastic job retooling it into Thor, just, you know, being lonely and wanting to hang out, because that's how I feel all the time. Yeah. And would love to direct a movie and hang out on set. That's a side note. Uh, I like the feeling of, like, everybody needs friendship in the movie, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not about, you know, them, you know, making up for your inadequacies, it's about, you know, making you more. And I like how originally, because it's been so many years, like five years, as the plot has changed around and it's locked in to finish up everything. But like, the end, like Love and Thunder, like the concept of why it's called that changed, and I really like what the reason it's called that now. Yeah, and it's uh, fantastic. Uh, I don't really have any complaints. I thought that there would be political uh, sort of bullshit happening. And I was glad that that was just what we thought the trailer was, which yeah. is this tourist trap, which it already sort of looked like. Yeah. And there was nothing else. It's also in the trailer, they actually show off some scenes of them maybe going to the place where Zeus is, you know, that floating place. But there's some additional scenes where the black ladies walk in with whoever in some plaza that wasn't in the movie. So there's some more footage. Yeah probably be retooled in, in the, the next, next movie, movie. So, yeah I assume so yeah so anyways like I repeat told you it wasn't Zeus yep. he parties he has sex he drinks yep. a lot he's dynastony the dynastic <laughs> deny whatever. yeah so then yeah Kurt Russell can show up and then Russell Crowe as his son you know yeah cause can, they're both Crowe yeah. or Russell Crowe Russell yeah it's funny yeah <laughs> It's funny that that's how it works out, you know, in the plot. I like it. Yeah, he can say, you know, boy, you've gotten out of shape. Like, how you've been running this terribly since I've been away. Like, in, you know, because he's uh, Ego. That's why he just called himself Ego, because he's the father of... Yeah, he's ashamed of what he made of the universe and the plot of Guardians of the Galaxy 2. It's kind of a secret that he's, you know, Zeus, but everybody knows that. Come on. Yeah, so... He's going to kind of show up and uh, shame on everybody and, uh, you know, look in horror at what everything's happened and turned into. Yeah. As a bunch of people get dragged back to an eternal party that he, they should be at for summoning Dynastines with their laziness and, you know, partying like gluttony. Yeah, and lack of ability to actually address situations at hand. Yeah, yeah, with their fear, cowardice, and gluttony, yeah. you know, they chant his name and summoned him out of a cloud. It took a lot of energy in the scene, didn't it? Yeah, I like it. Yeah, so then, you know, the people that were unhappy didn't say anything, but you didn't see them chanting his name when he showed up, you know. Yeah. As for the uh, color gods, I don't know, they'll show up at some later date, maybe. Maybe uh -huh. a few, maybe. That's kind of my series. Yeah, that's kind of a separate thing, but yeah. it's fun that they added in all the different types of gods. Yeah, I thought it was great. Uh, I can't wait for uh, Lady Jane Foster in the other movie that's coming up where it she's not actually called Lady Thor. It's just this movie that she's called that, apparently. And she has further explorations into her getting empowered, you know, and getting over her Yeah, to be clear, issues. how she's in heaven, um, that's sort of like uh, and the effect of Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. So, she's not gone completely from the series, and she'll be in the next movie like we already explained, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, you're watching our YouTube It's a videos. journey. The, the movies are a journey, and the next movie has Thor epically journeying across vast distances in epic ways. I just love journey type yeah. movies where it's not the road trip, it's the fastness of getting there and being epic. Exactly. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Oh, one more thing. I thought it was hilarious that they added in the, um, <laughs> it made it, it bre brevity the cancer situation a little bit when they said it was uh, a Marvel phases joke. Yeah. I, I really 
appreciated that. I think we came up with that though. Like, yeah. Because it the we're, series so far has been cancer. Yeah, phase three that we're still hovering at the edge of is cancer, and we got to move forward into remission, right? Yeah, into remission <laughs> and uh, you know omission of uh, you know yeah. stupid decisions. And maybe even intermission if the movie's long enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, everybody was complaining because there are a bunch of gays. Just so everybody's aware. That they don't want to see Thor's, you know, muscular body naked at any form, at any angle, because they're men. So if Natalie Portman wanted to do a scene in a movie, then she could do that classic, like, silver screen thing, you know, in a bunch of movies where you have, like, the angel, like, you know, tied cloth because she's in heaven over her tits, like, over the areolas and nipples, so you still, you know, so she can show off how in shape she is. And how much, like, her boob, you know, is, like, you know, real muscular, you know. And, like, come out of some water pool, you know, like, and have it tied around her, her, you know, as she gets out of it or something. You know, yeah. the classic female scene where they get out of a crystal clear lake or something. Yeah, yeah. And then she can drink a bunch of, you know, I don't know, like, honey mead and have it pour all down her tits or something. If, yeah. she, if she wants to do that. In slow motion, checking we'll throw out, around. Know, yeah, checking out uh, Asgard, you know, the heaven version of it. Yeah, because you know she's all angelic, angelic. Yeah. and no sodium, or yeah. else you won't be as buff. Yeah. The audience um, responded really well to the screaming goats. Uh, I, I, they had a great time in the theater. They responded really well to almost all the jokes, except for the, the cancer joke, which huh. uh, of course they wouldn't think is funny. Only I thought was funny. I got I got a glare at for laughing at it, but I didn't make the script, so yeah. you know. Um, other than that, I mean, uh, what did they not laugh at? Oh, she jumped the gun and flew out. I don't think anybody laughed, even if they thought it was amusing. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they didn't like it. Yeah, I was just confused and didn't realize it was a joke until it was too late. So it's not funny. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I guess that was them too. Yeah, I just knew it was coming. So yeah, yeah, I, I forget. <laughs> he forgets. I guess one more thing as we head into the, our own valley back home would just be that um, I'm super happy with all the music choices. They're all super rock and roll, 70s, 80s, 90s hits that are like definitely yeah. into the metal genre, a lot of them. And they're some of my favorite I like to listen to a lot too. Somewhere is, in there it said something was composed by Enya, I don't know. Yeah, Enya played, you know, for a moment. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah, that was nice. I mean, no complaints. Okay, so you know in the movie how Gore the Destroyer, he's being manipulated by a dark entity that's sealed in a sarcophagus uh, somewhere, you know, at Thor's uh, home city or whatever. So in the next movie, because Thor's such a powerful character, when Thanos um, snaps his fingers and kills half of everyone, you know, Doctor Strange says that there's a ton of versions of the universe of the multiverse that so everybody dies, or half of everyone at least. And Thanos, evil Thanos, wins and he makes everyone super sad and nothing can continue. In that version of reality, that's the one where Thor has the missing eye, is way more uh, desperate, but he has Lady Jane, you know. She's pregnant, she has the cancer still because it's She's a regular human, and all versions of humans have cancer, you know, if they have it in one place. Because it gets into what cancer even is, finally. And it gets into the other version of Gore the Destroyer, and the shadows that were possessing him, how that's the entity that's still hidden away. And so when Natalie Portman dies of her cancer and simultaneously defeats the good version of, Thor of Gore, then it gets her to heaven to deal with the next set of events. Yeah really convenient you know yes because uh you know she's uh got to come back because yeah. uh you know hold on there you know she's uh because i mean yeah thor uh can apparently visit asgard but the question is it doesn't seem like the asgard she's visited is the same one it seems to be the alternate timeline well it's heaven it's, it's uh heaven, whatever it's asgard, called it's, yeah it's, it's not asgard it's uh whatever they call that yeah more intense will whatever I don't whatever know. that's called my yeah. point is that yeah he gets there through pure love which is the next movie but she's already gone yeah it's the plot. yeah we've seen a synopsis a little bit and we'll work it out yeah all 
right, so the son of Dinosthenes, who's pretending to be Zeus to keep everybody calm, he appears out of the crowd, you know, or I mean, out of the party heaven, yeah. where he's being tortured, pretends he's Zeus, tries to tell Thor that everyone's real scared, and then you just, just need to hide out, you know, from Gore the Destroyer. Uh, what was the point of what I was saying? Well, you were just describing what happened. Um that his son is, uh, uh, you know, uh, just an egotist, so he just likes the comparison yeah, because Xerxes. Hercules hasn't been seen in a while. Yeah, so... Because he's on an infinite quest for something or other. So Xerxes is pretending to be Hercules vaguely. Because it's like Xerxes, this is a joke I made Because he's Zeus's time. son, he's yeah. Dinosthenes, and then his son is Xerxes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just funny to me. Call him Zerk. Yeah. You see, it's sort of like a joke about inbreeding, like you become a discount god because he's, you know, Zercules. And he goes around, like, being distracted by every weightlifting competition yeah. with another amateur deity on any planet instead of going through yeah. a portal. And, like, he's first introduced at some market square where he purchases some fine oil from some tree. And he's like, that'll be good. And then as he's, like, staring at him, he just starts pouring it all over his bare chest and oiling himself up like how people do for movies, but he's just doing it because he's obsessed with himself and he like walks into scene where he's actually going to be going, you know, yeah. like, because he's just nothing. Well, I mean, it's kind <laughs> of a joke, like we're saying about how they're trying to vaguely cover up whose child it is because, you know, the, the orgy thing, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. who fucked who, yeah. so it's kind of funny, you know. This is the joke, yeah. Yeah, so the electricity goes through him and accelerates his heart, you know, horribly. Um, Russell Crowe, uh, his character, because he's Dinosthenes. And so he's trapped outside of his eternal party. And, you know, he doesn't want to go back. He's desperate because they were only summoning through them through their laziness and inactivity, you know. So he uses that energy to, just like the joke of him right now, uh, to... <laughs> have a montage that's, you know, like Thor's, but it's like it's super spoiled, like, you know, so he can do it, which is what I'm advising, you know, same old thing. Like, you have, like, super big booty hoes, you know, that are secretly, like, you know, men massaging his muscles like I would have, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that they have the super strength to drag his muscles out to either side, you know, like, after he's been, like, you know, benching weights, yeah, he's got and he's got, like, all these silly weights that are all golden and everything's all made out of crystal and stuff. And he's drinking out of, like, a click crystal sports bottle and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> because, uh, you know, the Dinostatines uh, broke his his uh, clavicle with, a, you know, his own lightning bolt of pain. Yeah, his solar plexus. Solar plexus. Then he's got to do gentle cable pulls like a pregnant woman that are all expanded there. So then, you know, the joke is that he's exercising with all the pregnant, you know, like goddesses and stuff and demigoddesses. Like it's a stupid class where he's got to do all the, all the exercises. Yeah, the rubber band exercises. Yeah, stuff, all the ones yeah. that have gotten popular, all the ones on the walls and over his shoulder and stuff. Yeah, so then as the, you know, women are stretching, you know, for childbirth and everything, doing their, you know, exercises, then he's... His belly gets smaller as theirs get bigger, you know, in the montage. Yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, it's just funny. I don't know. You know, when, uh, you know, if I can have it, if you know, because I heard they all met up in a warehouse. So if Kurt Russell's available then, and can, like, you know... Swing his big dick. Shape, you know? Yeah. I don't know. You know, like... At least, like... He doesn't have to be perfect. Come yeah, on. no, I just meant, you know, like, flattish, you know, so enough. And yeah. Then, like, you know, big arms. Yeah, but, so he uh, isn't all bulgy in the front with yeah. swellings, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, I'm the, the actor health problems, I don't know. I mean, the point would be that he would show up, and I know he likes Mexican telenovelas, even though he lies about it, because I, Goldie Hawn is one of those type of chicks, so if he's in a relationship with her, then they really like that. Yeah, so they'll then, never reveal it, it's their dirty secret. Yeah, right. So then, Kurt Russell all, like, comes in, you know what I mean, and he's all, like, you know, because they're both Russell, Russells, we're getting their Jimmy's Russell, you know? Yeah. So he, like, 
flies in, you know what I mean, on like with like lightning, like you know, like as if it's he's like sliding down either side, like from his veins, like out through his fingertips, out into the air. Yeah, he's, like, slides down on lightning, you know, like cast this like sliding through it, you know what I mean, like down from like a cloud. Yeah, and he, like, falls through, you know. And like slams into the ground. Like he's a cat person in the jungle in the Avatar movie falling through leaves. Yeah, yeah, you know, sort of, you know, but it's like. But like effect. he's controlling it more. Yeah, he's, you know, yeah, what I mean? striating down, yeah. And he's like, you know, shows up, and it's like this comparison to Natalie Portman where he's like the exact opposite, like where it just goes right into it, and there's no, like, as if it's like Mexican telenovela instead of like how <laughs> she's. Uh, you know, like, just says she has cancer and it's very, you know, like, sad or something. It's like, he shows up because he's the one who had cancer. Yeah. And he's gone. So then he's all, like, you know, storms into the room or whatever and smash up, just smashes open giant doors that, like, float upward while co with electricity, like, crackling off of them into the air. You know, yeah. Like just floating different directions for the 3D, of course. And he's like, you know, uh, Dionysus. You, you fucking bitch. And he's like, in my absence, you've been encouraging absolute, you know, like... Debauchery. And then debauchery, you know what I mean? And he's all like, why? You know, and then, and then like, but when he, like, comes in, he's all like, like, saying this, and then he, like, stops, and he's like, why? You know what I mean? Yeah. But his version of it, you know, how he all does his specific cartoony Kurt Russell-y thing he does in movies, even though he doesn't think he does. Yeah. Just like how Nick Cage doesn't think he does the things he does. <laughs> so, then, you know, uh, Russell Crowe is like, um, geez, that, that, that felt weird um, when you pointed that in that mirror. Anyway, um, Russell Crowe is all like, I got, you know, impaled, and like, I like, you know, and he's like, no, what have you done? And he's like, but I'm like, not at the party, I'm like, and he's like, no, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how could you do this? Yeah, you gotta have the arms, stupid, you know I mean? yeah, and you got the crackling energy on all of his hair and beard, yeah. you know, all silly, because yeah. he's... He's Zeus, he's dramatic, he's stupid, but yet wise. Yeah, so then he's all like, he goes the pillar, he's all like, you're the biggest disappointment ever. I put you at that party to be safe. Yeah. You know? And, you know, and then uh, Russell Crowe's all like, oh, okay, but, you know, like, it is torment. And he's all like, would you rather be in, you know, Hades? Yeah, right. And then he's all like, it became the same thing. And he's like, I know. But I'm back, and you're here now, too. And then suddenly, grips him and hugs yeah. him, and he's all like, oh. And then everyone's, you know, creepy, gay lust activates, but we don't need to talk about that, because yeah. that's... that's That has nothing to do, that's just a supposedly a scene of how... Sorry, my PTSD it. from watching this in future in the theaters is activating already. Okay. My LSD PTSD. <laughs> yes. PTLSD. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, that sounds really good. I like it. Yeah, so the reason that Dionysus got himself into calling himself Thor is because they acted like Zeus. Zeus is because he was cowering, you know, and they like his energy because that's how it works. They all cave to his energy and summon him all the time because he takes the supposed fear away, you know, right? Yeah. He's that. Yeah. That's his god ability because of what he did. He parties all the time, so he takes their fear away, but it doesn't, you know, help overall. They're still fearful, and he's still an idiot, like, as his character. Yeah, so the joke is his name's hard to pronounce. So, like, he just, when people call him his father's name, he just goes with it because he, no one will be able to say his name, and it angers him. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny to me. Yeah. Because it's, you know, Dionysus. Yeah. I can't even say it most of the time. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I just feel like in the next Thor film, it'd be great if he went to a planet full of poppies that were oozing poppy sap, and he's, like, super powerful, so he, like, you know, sweeps some off of one of the, the poppy flowers, you know, like the Afghan poppies, and he's all like, mmm, and he's all like, they call this laudanum on Earth, you know what I mean? And then she's like, yeah, I'm surprising you're taking it so well, and then he, like, sits down on, like, a cactus or something.
Yeah. And he's all like, yeah, you know, uh, us as us guardians, uh, we're, we're pretty strong, you know, we don't notice much, you know, and she's all <laughs> like, yeah, you really don't, do you? As he's like sitting on the cactus, on the, like, the bright flower that's yeah. like still got spikes around it, you know? Yeah. All right, so you know how there's this whole dichotomy where Thor, there's the buffer Thor who's like more beaten up because he's in the t timeline where Thanos won and was he super evil. So then he's like got the missing eye and everything. And so what we're saying is Loki, his movie where he goes and finds that grail to heal things, you know, ultimately it's super, you know, touching because, you know, He's like, no, I got a grail so, you know, you can fix your eyeball, he says to his brother. Yeah, so that that fixes that. But, of course, in reality, because uh, I think it's funny that then Loki, you know, he gives it to him and because of the joke, the ongoing gag is, yeah. did you stick, you know, like, like you want to stick your penis in it? He's like, wait a minute, did you stick your penis in this? And then Loki's like, no, no, never. Why, why would I go through all this effort just to do that? Then he turns away from the camera, you know, like to the, you know, like to the dark side, yeah. you know, as he turns for a second away to like grab something and he's all like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then yeah. like back to him and he's all like, yeah, here you go. Yeah. Like the most extreme <laughs> yet Yoki, uh, Loki, I mean expression. Cause like supposedly he's over the series been like more and more comical. Like slowly he was clichely like sinisterly clever at the beginning in his jokes and it just gets more and more ludicrous, so it's just stupidest things ever. I love it. So, at the end of the next Thor movie, because my brother came up with this idea, because he wasn't figuring out quite how Natalie Portman would get out of Valhalla and into, you know, not being there right as he shows up comedically, it'd be that she's working for the, the Nordic version of death and that uh, he has a job for her to do. And so... She has to go, you know, different versions of it, welcome old people, you know, in different spots. Backward in time, because dead time is nothing to death, uh, that we're dying at random points throughout the history of um, that other place that exploded that's not Valhalla that I keep forgetting about. Yeah, well, because they were and hiding like, from it, Valhalla, in fact. Yeah. If you look in the uh, actual lore of history of silliness, then... They're openly rebels from Valhalla who are already dead and refuse to go there because they think they have more war to achieve and stuff. And so Thor is alive and his father is dead. That was the plot the whole time, just saying. Um, yeah, um, she obviously... Because we know that as the universe we're living in is very flawed, that as things pan out into the future, then suddenly death has her go, right, to do different Nordic things, to get different people from the past who were in places where they were not accessible before by death because the universe is twisted and death isn't functioning in places is the plot. Yeah, so then at the end of the movie, after Thor uh, does everything he does, he smashes, like Eamon already said before, through everything, and the, the big, even bigger planet that's actually her cancer explodes. Then, you know, her final task, because it's her body, as she shows up all comedically with glowy light, you know, after, he, like, he's flying in space like it's badass, you know, and then the music kind of trails out as he's trailing, like, away from all the explody stuff. Then she shows up out of a rift, you know, hewn in the air in space as he's flying with his hammer away and starts drawing all of the souls with some sort of magical item. I don't know what it would be. Probably some sort of scythe reaper thing that, you know, would flash out energy and gather souls, you know, just like any reaper. Yeah, because there's some amount, uh, because they're close to the same country's regions, upper European there is some amount of, um, I would say very little paganism, but quite a bit of um, uh, whatever it's called, uh, Wiccanism in Nordic mythology, especially in the more recent uh, periods of thousands of years. So a scythe is perfectly acceptable is all I got to say. And it is a symbol of harvest as everywhere know, in the world. The, the Reaper of Nordics uh, rides a motorcycle or a giant ram 
and it's just what you'd think it is, you know, um... I'm pretty sure he has chains wrapped around both arms up them, like part of his flesh. And uh, that's what Ghost Rider is ripping off from Legend. Okay, good to know that Ghost Rider, for some reason, is that too much, even though it could have been a little more original. See, that's why I'm saying stop muddying things so that we can kind of make a plot for characters that make sense. That's all. I guess if Nick Cage is willing, he can reprise his role as Ghost Rider. I know it's a long time between movies, but it makes sense with what Eamon's saying if he's just ripping it off anyways, that he should be Nicolas Cage, you know, Death Edition in this series and uh, I guess join the MCU for an appearance. Yeah, like um, whether he's... There's different deaths of different genetics, and so he could be another death. Um, we could get an even more Nordic guy directly, but it seems like he's already Ghost Rider, and it just fits, you know? Yeah. It just seems like he should just be doing the role. I don't know. It seems appropriate. All right, Natalie Portman is now so super dead. Uh, Nicolas Cage explains to her as the Ghost Rider... Um, who is the, of course, mythic death dealer and, you know, life restorer of Nordic mythology. So he says to her, wow, you really saved some children, but now you're extra super dead and your love has brought you here to this place, but all your energy is left is negative energy, death energy. So then... He sets her on tasks to go back through history and remove children from different periods of time, uh, different children that died in different wars, bombings and stuff. So then instead of her showing up with electricity ions and blasting everything and changing anything, instead she's showing up in a black cloak with enormous titties, you know, to beckon the children who have died, you know, in the instant before they die, so they don't feel the pain, off to heaven and to be reincarnated into life again as somebody else's child. Um, I guess we can stop the video there and I'll pick it up in a second. So then Natalie Portman is introduced to the real death zone reverse existence of history and along with that come the characters in the multiverse of madness where the woman who cuts out of that same place with the giant death shears that turn into individual you know death um many um what are those called uh sides she's a character that would be <clears throat> dealing with stuff and death as well and maybe meet natalie portman at some point but the point here is is that Natalie Portman, uh, she's fighting these creatures, the Deviants, who are trying to capture the souls of children because they're still full of energy at the point where battles are taking place and terrible things, uh, occurrences have happened, even natural disasters, and hold that energy there and not let the hourglass of time move on, the sands of time, which are the people of time. And so... Then she's allowed to use massive amounts of death energy um, with an enormous scythe that she summons that's flaming like she's a ghost rider. And um, the colored energy that these um, deviants steal, if you've seen, you know, the movie Eternals, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um... They're pretty much unstoppable. Gods or those who have been given God's powers, the it's like they're abusing the colors of different universes and like fading between realities and you can't get them. You can't do a deal with them. But she's given the flames of absolute death, the smoldering decay, so the orange flames are able to cleave them into pieces and then their tentacles, you know, try to reform and she blasts them with fire in giant waves because it's like a good video game tie-in, you know what I'm saying? <laughs>
and it uh, gives her opportunity to express a more extreme emotions and then interact with children really uh, tenderly so that her best attributes come out easily so it's an easy role for her. Alright, when she's really getting perturbed because, you know, there's a bunch of <laughs> deviant creatures attacking when she's trying to do her work as a reaper, then she keeps expelling more energy and her eyes start to flame, you know, and then at a certain point, just like Ghost Rider, she sort of, sort of bursts into complete flames, but instead it's like she's all like moonlit across her body, all silvery, and then she has enormous wings that explode out that are smoldering black death with orange fire in them that, you know, buffet enemies away and shield the children and do different things, you know, like she's a some sort of death dealing angel demon. There's, of course, in the environment, because I don't want it to be all depressing, there's, like, brightly colored cactuses illogically, like, you know, growing on top of the buildings that are, like, cinder block, single story. I know how L.A. is terrible. Yeah. And there's, like, sand everywhere with, like, all the brightly colored cactus, fruits and cactuses everywhere. So then Nick Cage walks up to one of those, like, cactuses with, like, the brightly colored, like, purplish pink fruits, you know, the ones that, that you pick off the top that grow. They're super delicious. Yeah. And he, like, you know, sticks it in his mouth and, like, chews it, and he's all like, mmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's nice to have the flavors of the desert back in my mouth or something stupid. Because people love Nicolas Cage's bizarre lines where he says that. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here, beetle. <sighs> Get out of my room. Anyways, um, yeah, I was thinking that, like, as he's pulled comedically all the sand particles of him back together to, to you know, reconstitute his data on Earth, um... Like, you know, there'd be, like, one of those houses that's outside of a city where it has its own leech lines and septic system. And so then, like, you know, like, a bunch of, like, particles of, like, decomposed stuff is, like, yanked out of the field along the leech line as, like, orange flaming particles that are, like, burning, you know, like, as though he sort of... <laughs> shit his own self into the soil, you know? Yeah, like he lost too many cells and yeah. aged really badly. Because that's what happens. You get end up, you know, losing all of yourself through shit into the bronze soil. It's great, let me tell you. But then in another scene, of course, he, he uh, you know, in, in the movie, he has to uh, step off his motorcycle because he's, like, out in the desert for whatever reason. And, you know, he's just driving through. And then yeah. for absolutely no reason in relation to the plot, he just eats a peyote because that's just cool. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because it reminds me of the time back when I was 17 and I was going through the Badlands. Yeah, anyways, and I got to the very center of it on the worst highway. It was just rained. It was super dangerous and was like a slope so I could like slide down to my doom. But there was this cactus like 10 feet out from the road and I like slithered out to it and took out my pocket knife and carefully cut off the two little, you know, ripe fruits on it. And let me tell you, my life was never the same. <laughs> That's another story though. Boy, I just told all right, and actor Nicolas Cage as Ghost Rider helps Natalie Portman's character, Jane, like, recover a bunch of ghost children data that's, like, stuck in different periods of time, you know, and do all that kinds of stuff. Then he gets, you know, the ghost particle energy to reassemble on Earth as a reward. So, like, but what happens is all the particles from around, you know, where he lived on the planet that have, like, his residue on them... Like, they all, like, this giant wind swirls from different directions, pulling all the particles from all over, you know, from the whole valley area where he lived in, you know. I guess it could be L.A. Valley comedically, I don't know. So it's like this tugging wind on the palm fronds, and then it suddenly sweeps from all angles in, and, like, pulling all these little bits of sand particles from all directions as he, like, reforms, as it spins together in a tornado, you know, of, like, orange acid flames up, you know, from his 
cowboy boots first, you know. Yes, and then it would go to his blue jeans that appear like, you know, like as if they like appear falling over the cowboy boots from flames that are coming up, like insane coming together yeah. like, simultaneously, like he's a fire tornado. Yeah. And it's like it's comedically his bones grow first, like formed out of shape <laughs> yeah. before the like the blue jean you know catches up up his thighs and like you know like forms a shiny like s- you know stupid belt that's like silver gold whatever he pre- prefers it goes like yeah. as like it bursts into flames and then solidifies as he screams an extra pain like you know as if it's a big <laughs> burst into flames and then yeah. it forms up his body you know as a superheated flame line of his abs and everything up through his chest you know twisting up to his body as he's all to you know pose the side like this you know for it to the cg to complete as he goes ah you know, and then and like, it stops yeah. and reforms over the last spot yeah. right above his forehead by his eye. And goes, out. then he goes, oh, I, I, there's nothing going on. You know what I mean? Like, there's, like, the pain just yeah. instantly stops. So and then, like, oh, then you have to have, like, the switch of the camera filter to, like, instantly regular, extra regular platinum daylight with, like, regular trees and people. I guess because <laughs> the, the joke of this would be because it's, like, you know... LA's like a shithole in my opinion that it would be like LA is like covered in like sand and stuff and there's only like Mexicans walking around with sombreros yeah. on because it's the future and like yeah. fucking you know because it's blazing hot sun and just cactuses growing out of like spots <laughs> all over the place yeah yeah so it's extra hellish exactly I like it yeah you got like some like you know corrugated rice fields going down the mountain beside where the Hollywood you know warehouses were yeah, and then, like, he, <laughs> he you know, he, he steps, you have him step, take the first step forward or whatever, and his foot comes down, and it's all, like, it's all, like, you know, like, ching with, yeah. like, the boot or whatever, yeah, and then there's, like, the tss yeah. of, like, the sand, like, you know, even because his foot's even hotter than it is yeah. when he takes the first couple steps, you know, as he walks off. Exactly. It's like, leaves, like, glass, you know, sparkly bits, you know. Behind. Exactly. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Wow, we really explained it good. All right, when Hulk is fighting his sister, you know, he and Loki are fighting Loki's sister, it's like they're an infection on their family line, Loki and her, but that doesn't mean they have to be evil, but she's trying to be a terrorist and from the inside out destroy them as it shows, break them at the genetic level. And so... At the same time, there's another version of Thor that is genetically strong and separate from that. So he, this next movie, it starts right from the point where he he and Loki get cast out of the stream of energy on the way back to Asgard and scattered to different random locations, supposedly. But actually, they just get sucked into the you know junk dimension, right? That level of existence and um. So this time, we, we skip all the bull crap and we go right to my plot, and he's just super powered, he's just lost his eye, it's constantly glowing with lithium the entire movie, he's super pissed off, it's epic, and it's like, he's going insane, because it's the part of him as already was shown in the movie that came out, he's desperate to get Jane back because it was the cancer that really separated them apart the whole time and so the part of him that's feeling the most like that inside the caged beast or whatever of his sexuality is (laughs) it's so nerdy I'm sorry is um that version of him that we see in the next movie the deplorability of the junk pirate in Thor Ragnarok as I watched it again, which is why I didn't want to watch it, and everybody acting like as if they might as well have a backstory of... It's not exactly Mark Ruffalo's fault, because it's just CG. Um, him just murdering everybody in a gladiator tournament. This is already adding on to what we're saying, but the point is that Thor becomes so powerful because, you know, he's, like, in shape as a god instead of, like... He's a god that's in shape, like, as if it's even more extreme. That when he's fighting him around the reactor, why Thor uh, activates it is because he shocks Hulk all the way down to the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 Infinity Ward symbol that goes around his nuclear green energy, all the way down to those cells and actually splits them in half, 
with lithium lightning from his body. He's so enraged because Hulk beat him so viciously in a grudge match with so many degenerates around. Which he could even say as he goes into it. And so that he's basically just going to, you know, kill him and he doesn't really care because he's in love. And love matters above all else. So he just says Hulk doesn't know what love is so he'll kill him. Yet to remember, this is in the multiverse of madness where it's the other version of Hulk who's even a bigger dick, right? Yes. So when Thor shows up from the junk universe, like I said, to deal with that version of Hulk wherever he comes out, he um then beats the shit out of him like Grant's saying, and then he, Hulk himself, gets ends up getting lost. In the, uh, I can asshole into the, um, suction of the open wormhole and goes back, gets sucked to where Thor was, but through time, because it's the junk universe and everything's wrong, because everything's been turned into powder and all the humans and everything and everything's mixed up, like it was saying, it says in the movie. So then, he's fighting Hulk because where he went to... Evil Hulk is there, part of the supposed, you know, Marvelous Heroes or whatever, and that hall, you know, built by Iron Man again. But he's even a bigger dick. Yeah. So he ends up fighting Hulk twice just because Hulk yeah. and, and interacts with him eventually. Like, yeah, it's circular reason. Yeah, because he's a problem. I don't know. So he really beats the shit no, out of No, and what I was saying is because uh, it, it's just annoying to have all the... I'm sorry, it's not... A, I'm a comic book fan. I'm not saying this for this reason. I hate power level discussions. I like movies. So just because I'm annoyed, all the little Hulkite fans are going to have to understand that throwing a giant baby tantrum and acting like you'll heal from it is not the end-all, be-all, just like being made out of nothing but red-slash-pink nut energy isn't everything. So, just like the Scarlet Witch, we have to have a reality check here where Thor is already so superhuman in the series. You know, Loki's a weakling, so he gets the shit beaten out of him by the Hulk. Yeah. But he comes back, and like I'm saying, it blisters the Hulk all the way down to the cellular level to where his veins that he would ordinarily grow with as he swells back up burn and blister all along his body in scarred regions because of how much electricity and lightning... Thor is pushing, tearing the whole lab apart, which is why he's flipping the fuck out, you know, like yeah. you're saying, uh, uh, Wyatt's character and trying to shield all the electronics, because Thor is just determined to tear everything to pieces, because he's in love, and he doesn't care, you know? You know, I would even add into the plot that the junk galaxy is the fault of the Hulk, because he's eating junk food. Yes. Yeah. I agree, 100%. Yeah. that's like Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> yeah. Mark Ruffalo, the the character, and that his all his junk food has led to the junk galaxy. Shame on you, Mark Ruffalo. No more junk food. When Jane Foster goes to Valhalla, the plot, as far as I've seen, seems to be that there she um, interacts with some sort of ancient. When Jane Foster goes to Valhalla, it's because it's the place where the energy of the warriors of all the universes, you know, that are untamed spirits, they've gone beyond the physical, then they're sucked to Valhalla. It's a place of, you know, spiritual energy where they're the last guardians against the black basic cancer of the whole series of um, Avengers. If you watch through the whole series, there's always the theme of just sort of black icor cancer really commonly, you know, taking over colors. There's always different themed color villains. And so all of that, when she goes to Asgard, is connected to her cancer, is connected to the fact that she's pregnant with Thor's baby the whole time. And so... When Thor goes to Asgard, I'm not to Asgard, uh, when Asgard is uh -huh. destroyed and he goes, yeah, what he said, he finds that she's not there because commonly when people are there, they end up going and battling cancer, black creatures, because it's like a waypoint 
sort of like a convenient video game thing, but you can make it seem epic, and it could tie into a video game, because I always love video games. And, um, so that's what we know so far. I'll talk more later. So the plot here is, where is Valhalla? It is people's genetics. It is what holds them together against radiation and blowing away when someone like Thanos, you know, snaps his fingers in the plot of this. And so, um, half of their genetics were cancerous and evil and were blown away to dust. And, uh, that cancer is still there in this Marvel Universe. And so Valhalla, Lady Jane Foster, Thor, in connection to her cancer and her pregnancy, it goes into all of the struggle of mankind with the darkness inside of them. You know, someone once said, we are all just sand, dust, and time being blown about. But, uh... You know, that sounds kind of valuable, this dust of humanity. Seems like it'd be collected up by someone and put into an enormous hourglass. And then, um, at the end of the universe that this Marvel culmination is coming towards, you could be, uh, have whichever characters at this giant hourglass of sand that is humanity. Because a long ago conflict, long before all this stuff that happened in Marvel, has already turned everyone into into dust. That's just the facts of life. And so, um, this huge hourglass is going to be spun by the giant cosmic cr divine creatures. And the new universe, is the, the cancer that's ending the current universe, is going to be flipped and all those grains of sand that are humanity's energy dust will start trickling back the other way through the hourglass it's just a concept i had you know i'm working on now let me uh now theoretically as long as uh he likes it what i was going to think about it is is the hourglass is sort of metaphysical and what you have is two different polarities of color energy with other striations mixing through them of cosmic gas and a giant you know universal mm -hmm. perspective backward as one's coming in the top and one's coming in the bottom as they meet in the middle in this sort of like fusion point, little spark, like star point. Yes. As like one pours to the other side as the gas is collected mostly on one side and is pouring through basically the little star slash like black hole in the middle. Because it's like a dual black hole where either end is, you know, sucking. But it's going through the, the starlight in the middle, the, the little super massive dense, you know, star in the middle. Yeah. And that would be the kind of shape of the hourglass in the overall universe itself, cosmically. Well, yeah, this uh, that's some symbology that I've uh, seen before. And that, what that brings to mind is the colors would be, in my opinion, green and purple on the either end. Because those are the balancing colors I've noticed of nature. Um, simply that, uh, in connection to that, uh, I have to think about this. All right, when Natalie Portman bathes in the spring in heaven, Valhalla, um, she comes out of the water with enormous bazongas, you know, it's like a joke, you know, digitally. And so then, um... The previous fertility goddess who's there, you know, who's been showing her around the place says, Oh, what a relief, you know, I'm so sick of being the fertility goddess here in heaven. And then her breasts are back to, you know, regular large size, you know, whoever the woman is. She no longer has huge breasts. Okay, anyways, because she's been chosen as the new fertility goddess because she's pregnant with Thor's child and all the other gods have all become weak in the universe as has been shown now in this latest Thor movie so she's now the fertility goddess she's battling the cancer that's eating at humanity and Valhalla is the arc point of the hourglass of time of the meeting of two universes so her love in connection to Thor is what makes her the most powerful character in the MCU confirmed. But it's because she has big titties. 
you know, so if when the dragon's asked if he eats like cosmic universe corpse dust or anything, he says, "No, I'm a vegetarian." That's what Hammond said, because what was it again? I'm a vegetarian because that's disgusting. It, it, it's like garlic and it causes me gas and gas is really bad for me. Yeah, because dragons, you know, the joke is they're made out of nothing but flammable gases compressed to the point where they're liquids half of the time. So, because, you know, lizards, they spit. So like a dragon, it spits like ignitant. How do you think it gets that flamethrower effect? Yeah. So it's like the lizard, it's speed, you know, fuck you, Vinny. So for people confused as to Lady Sif being injured in the snow, what it would be is that Lady Sif is a title because you see how most of their original homeland is kind of legend and lore even to themselves, even though they're powerful still as beings. So there hasn't been a Lady Sif, a.k.a. A goddess of fertility in the Nordic, you know, lore in a long time. Because you have to come back from heaven because you the world needs you to be a hero. So this is the next story where we tell Natalie Portman becoming the goddess of fertility and then having to be drawn back because she's, you know, Lady Thor. She's Sif. See, it's confusing because the Sif, when I was looking online here in mythology, has beautiful long golden hair that flows down, you know, to her knees. And then Loki tricks her into getting it cut because he's, oh, look at that trickster. And there's some silly legend, you know how those are, so you could fit that into a movie. But the point here is she would be Thor's original love interest way back when he was younger as a god, eons before. And she dies tragically. And she's not a warrioress or whatever. So she's sitting around in heaven as this giantess, it says in, in legend, that's like 10 feet tall. And she's the fertility goddess there, but she doesn't leave heaven because that's all she can do, you know? And so there, you can have a little drama, but Thor, I would just say, has moved on. And he's much more interested in Jane as a love interest and this other woman, even though she's big and sexy and has enormous titties, isn't a contest for Jane, but there could be some doubt in her head, maybe thinking that she's going to steal back Thor or something, even though that's not what's going to happen. Just for drama, you know? Yeah.